you'll warm up a little bit. Right. Get going. Um, I've been interested in how human beings learn. That's my central trajectory. And uh, I've also been, had some interest in physics and a variety of different things. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, I encountered your book. It must have been 87, 88, something like that. It came out in 86. 86, right. Yeah. And it was the first book that went implicate, <laughs> that talked about something that was deep in the fabric of everything that was generally taken for granted, not generally understood, and that it was having this this huge radiant effect on the world. And uh, at the time, I was working on what I called the inner interface, the, the inner learning, so the kind of tap mm-hmm. learning that regulate how we learn and how we think and how we do things. And so the alphabet effect was this bingo for me. And, uh, and it sat kind of in the background, as much as it was a great example of a very powerful way of looking at things. It wasn't until geez, uh, about four or five years ago when my learning work collided with reading. And I started to travel into the processing involved in reading uh-huh. and recognize the story, the confusion involved in all of that, which led me back to the alphabet and, and needing to tell its story in order to create the right context for understanding the challenge of learning to read. So these different streams have all kind of collided with one another. Having said all that, why don't you start with um, a little bit of, of Hmm. All right, I've, got, I've got, I've got, I've got really well, I had it just till it was gone where he was looking at me. It's still back. It's back. Yeah, the whole right side of the glasses. We're having some glasses glare. Okay. Should I wear different glasses? Can no, it's not. It's not me then. <laughs> no, 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 it's not you. <laughs> it's not you at all. Um, if you're comfortable without, that'd be great. Otherwise, we're going to need to adjust. Which light's which light's testing? Um, I've got um, on his. On the right side, and a little bit on the on the other side of his as well. Well, maybe I I just need to look so, in a different direction. Look at me here. Look over here. Uh, that's mm. Yeah. He's, um, oh, that's. Maybe that's what I had when. That's I, that's what you had. You're back here, so he's looking at. Okay. At how's you. that? Um, how can we? All right. That's fine. Can we check? Let's try looking right at David there. Look at David. Okay, that's where it does it when your head's here. So anyway, it's very well, when I'm looking at you, it's okay? That's perfect. That's, that's perfect. I'll look at you. Yeah, there you go. All right. Do I have permission, Maria? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking over her shoulder. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, anytime he's not talking, interrupt with me. Okay. All right. Wait, say that again? Anytime I'm not talking? Anytime you're not talking, she can interrupt whatever's going on. Are you talking to to Corey. To Corey or to oh. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Yeah, maybe just a little too delicate. Let's try the softball. The softball? Can we switch the angle? Um, let me come and look at this real quick. I just want to be sure because That's fine. Last players are What? It's too oh, hot for me. Yeah. You can stand outside. All right, whatever you like. Okay. Sit on the stairs. Yeah. I don't want to squeak or cough or something. <laughs> Did that improve? The other thing I can do is try to bounce this light differently. Mm. Is that everything? Hmm? <laughs> 
Oh, that won't happen again for another hour. Okay. <laughs> Forgot about that. How's that, Corey? Um, it's, it's all right. I mean, it's 2 o'clock, right? Yeah, it is. It's already 2. Um, that's not what's doing it either. I don't, you know. Um. Is it this? Looking at me, it's the least. Oh, is it still there? If I'm looking this way, is it there? Yeah. It's coming from this guy then. Yeah, I think it's acceptable. Okay. Especially when you come back to looking at Corey a few minutes off. Oh, yeah. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Why don't you change the angle on this one? Rotate it this way. I bet it'll... No, no. Rotate this way. I'm up against the couch. What happens now? What? Um, that's good right there. Okay. Yeah. But I don't want you to be too preoccupied with having to I'm put not. it in a certain position. But that works. Okay. All right, thank you so much. All right, let's go. Maria? She's on some beer. All right. So, maybe a 10 minute, five minutes, something like that. You know, your history, how you come to this, how you came to write the alphabet effect or put your mind into that space. And just talk? Mm -hmm. Okay. In 1971, I started a course called The Poetry of Physics. I wanted to bring science to humanity students. And in the course of teaching this subject, I encountered the following paradox. In China, almost everything that we know today was invented. Porcelain, magnetism, clockworks, silk, paper, gunpowder, ink. The list goes on and on. On the other hand, science began in the West, and I wanted to understand why technology began in the East and science began in the West. So I started to look around for what it was about Western culture that produced science and what was missing in Eastern culture. I came up with two things. First was a monotheism, and the second was codified law. You put monotheism and codified law together, and you get the idea of universal law, which is a central notion in science. I thought that might explain why science began in the West and not the East. At the same time, I became interested in future studies and started a seminar at the University of Toronto called the Club of GNU, in which we met once a week to talk about issues regarding the future of humankind. And I was fortunate enough to recruit Marsha McLuhan to the seminar. He had heard about my course of Poetry of Physics and invited me to have lunch with him. So we went off to the uh, refectory at St. Michael's College where he taught, and we sat down and we started talking about my course. And he said to me, well, what are you doing? What have you learned? So I told him what I was interested in. And he said, well, there's one thing you forgot about uh, what exists in Western culture and does not exist in Eastern culture. Do you know what that is? And I was totally flabbergasted because the guy was talking 100 miles an hour and I had just trouble keeping up with him. So I said, I give up, tell me. And he said, the alphabet effect. I let out this tremendous groan because I, as he said that, I remembered how he had connected the alphabet with deductive logic and abstract science. So we just sat there and we said, hey, let's put the five of these things together. Alphabet, monotheism, codified law, abstract science, deductive logic. They all took place between the Tigris-Euphrates River and the Aegean Sea between the years 2000 BC and 500 BC. And it's not a coincidence that they are connected to each other. Why? Well, you see, when you use an alphabet or a phonetic writing system, you have to break up the sound of names or words into their basic phonemes. 
So let's take your name, for instance, David. David. As soon as I say David, I go d i v i d, and I analyze your name into basic phonemes. And then, if I want to write your name, I represent those basic phonemes in terms of meaningless signs, the letters of our alphabet. So when you use an alphabet, you're first of all doing analysis, breaking up words into their basic phonemes. Then you code them with visual signs when you write, and when you read, you decode. Now, not only that, but you also have a classification system because every word in our language can be ordered by alphabetization, which is a classification system. So, using the alphabet as a means of communication also gave for free analysis. Coding, decoding, and classification, and these are the basic elements of abstract science and deductive logic. Now, what about codified law? Well, the first codified law systems came in with Hammurabi around 2000 BC, just after they had a phonetic writing system. Next mystery: monotheism. Well, when Moses went to Mount Sinai, he came down with a law written with the finger of God. The law written with the finger of God. At the same time that Moses introduced the Ten Commandments, which was codified law, he came with a written code written with alphabetic writing, and he introduced a new form of monotheism. You see, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob are really three ancestral gods. And of course, when the Bible was written. The people that wrote the Bible wanted us to think that they were the same God, but the name of God for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was Elohim, which is plural for El, which was the principal God of Canaan. Moses introduced a new name for God, which was Yahweh. In English, we say Jehovah. But Yahweh is part of a Hebrew grammatical construction, Yahweh Asher Yahweh, which means. That which brought things into being, often translated or mistranslated as "I am that I am." So God was that which brought things into being. He was the first cause. So Moses gave monotheism, alphabetic writing, and codified law to the Hebrew people as he came down from Mount Sinai. This is the reason why they had such stiff necks in the desert. Three revolutions all at once. All right. Just to play it safe, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to, to rewalk through. And when you come to the point of your conversation with um, Marshall McLuhan, where he suggests the alphabet, reintroduce his name in case I want to cut that clip. You know, so I'm going to. I want the whole thing, and then I want to be able to cut in and out of that, where I can, where somebody will know who you're talking about mm -hmm. as you get close to that point. Follow? Yeah. Okay. In 1970, I started a course called the Poetry of Physics because I wanted to bring science to humanity students. As a result of that, I became interested in the impact of science on civilization, and was trying to deal with a very curious fact, namely that most technology was invented in China, but science began in the West. China was the origin of paper. Ink, printing, gunpowder, silk, porcelain, metallurgy, clockworks, post and aft stern for steering ships. It goes on and on. Question becomes: If technology came from the east, why did science begin in the west? I looked to two things that were unique about the west. One was the fact that we had a monotheistic tradition, and the second thing was that we have codified law. China had law, but it was not codified. If you combine monotheism with codified law, what do you get? You get universal law, which is a central element in science. After I started the poetry physics course, I became interested in future studies, and organized a seminar that met weekly to talk about the future, called the Club of Gnu. And I had the good fortune of recruiting Marshall McLuhan to this seminar. 
He had heard about my course of poetry and physics and asked me to have lunch with him. So I agreed. I was delighted. What a thrill to have lunch with Marshall McLuhan. So off we went to St. Michael's College, where he was a professor of English. And we sat down, and he asked me, well, what are you doing in the poetry of physics? So I said, well, I'm trying to understand the origin of science in the West in terms of codified law and monotheism. Well, then McLuhan said to me, Bob, there's something else that happens in the West that didn't happen in the East. Do you know what it is? And I couldn't, for the life of me, think of what it was even though I had read McLuhan. He intimidated me because he talked 100 miles an hour. So I said, look, I give up. What is it? And he said, the alphabet. And I let out the loudest groan because as soon as he said that, I remembered how he connected alphabet with abstract science and deductive logic. So we sat there munching on our food and decided to write a paper together, which we called Alphabet, Mother of Invention, in which we claimed alphabet, codified law, monotheism, abstract science, and deductive logic formed five ideas that began uniquely in the West between the Tigris-Euphrates River and the Aegean Sea in the short time frame between 2000 BC and 500 BC. It was beautiful, and we published that paper, published in a magazine called Etc. by Neil Postman, who was the editor. Excellent. Thank you. I got the McLuhan in at the right time? I think so, yeah. yeah that was good. So, um, subsequent to this, you began work. He uh, got sick and died. Right. Correct? And you, you continued on this trajectory, kind of uh, inspired and fueled by his acknowledgement of the work and your fusion together. And uh-huh. So when was this event with meeting him, and when did you, uh, you publish the book in 86? So how long did you work on it? Well, should I tell the story about how we tried to publish the book, but it didn't? Sure, we published it. Yeah, go wherever it will warm you up to. All right, good. So we published this paper with, uh, in etc., called Alphabet Mother of Invention. And it was our intention to turn the paper into a full length book. About a year later, Marshall was all excited because he got a telephone call from people at Boker, which is a publishing house focusing on books on the library. And a fellow came up from New York to talk to us about a book. And Marshall explained what our project to him. The guy from Boker said, well, we wanted a book on the history of the library. It looks like we didn't communicate well with each other. Typical. Here is the great expert of communication, Marshall McLuhan, and he couldn't get a telephone conversation straight. That was typical of Marshall. At any rate, I chimed in and I said, well, without the alphabet, how could you organize a library? Marshall McLuhan picked up that sentence and took off with it and flew around the room for about half an hour explaining the connection between the library and the alphabet. We had a contract. The guy said, well, I came for a book on libraries. You wanted to sell me a book on alphabet. Let's combine them together, and you guys can do a book on the future of the library. We started working on that book, and unfortunately, Marshall fell ill, subsequently had a stroke, and passed away a year later. The book on the library never was completed. But I felt that really I owed it to Marshall's memory to work on this alphabet project because that was much more important than the future of the library, which is also very important. But I felt that there was something key about understanding the impact the alphabet had on learning and education. And so I decided to focus on that project and began working on a book that subsequently I called The Alphabet Effect. The reason I call it The Alphabet Effect is because the alphabet has this enormous effect on teaching people to think differently. You see, McLuhan had taught us that the medium is the message. The alphabet is a medium. And what is its message? Well, its message is analysis, codification, decodification, and classification. That is why it takes 
one of our children has to learn to read with an alphabet just as long to learn how to read as a Chinese kid, even though the Chinese kid has to learn thousands of characters before they can read. Our children have to learn 26 letters in the alphabet, and then they can read. Why does it take them so long to learn how to read? Well, when they learn how to read with an alphabet, they're learning how to do more than just read. They're learning how to analyze, code, decode, and classify. That's why it takes them so long to learn how to read. Uh, in an earlier cycle, you made reference or connected up um, the basic principles of science with these same uh, analyze, code, decode, so forth. you want to make that point one more time for me? Okay. What is the connection between the alphabet and science? Well, there's lots of connections. First of all, what you're doing in science is you're always analyzing. And as I pointed out earlier, with the alphabet, you analyze the sound of words into their basic phony. But it, it goes further than that. There's also the fact that you learn how to classify things with an alphabet. Kids learn there are all the words that begin with A, all the words begin with B, all the words that begin with C. So they're taught classification when they learn how to use the alphabet. But I think there's an even more profound uh, aspect to the connection between alphabet and science. And I have to think of what it is. So we better stop rolling. I'll pick up where I, where I stopped. Okay, what did I want to think now? Let's run, let's run the whole sequence in the beginning. Okay. But let's talk about the connection between the alphabet and science. There's a very strong connection, in my opinion. First of all, uh, it was only maybe 100 or 200 years after the Greeks obtained the phonetic alphabet, which they borrowed from the Phoenicians, that they first began developing abstract science. So just on a historical basis, we see a causal connection. First, the alphabet comes to Greece, and within 100 or 200 years, they're beginning to develop abstract science, beginning with people like Thales and Anaximander and Eximenes, who were analyzing the world in terms of some basic unit. For Thales, it was water. For Anaximander, it was a pyron, a neutral substance. And for Anaximander, it was air. So the idea of trying to explain everything in terms of some basic elements is paralleled when you think that you can represent all the words in your language with just 26 letters. This is analysis, taking something complex and breaking it down into its basic units. And this is what you do when you make use of alphabetic script. So there is one connection of science and the alphabet. Another connection, of course, is classification. When you're learning the alphabet, you learned all the words that begin with A, all the words that begin with B, all the words that begin with C. For the Greeks, actually, it was alpha, beta, gamma. And you're learning classification. That's another important aspect of science. It's classification. So when you put classification together with analysis, you have the basic ingredients for abstract science. Let's touch a minute on um, the differences between the writing systems before the alphabet and the alphabet and the, the moment or the, the, the birth of the alphabet, the first beginnings of it, either in the Moses story or probably in Mesopotamia. Hieroglyphics. I already told the Moses story. We caught that, right? Without glare? We have to get Moses in here. All right, let's talk about uh, f um, how the alphabet was invented. Okay. Uh, you're not rolling it, right? I'm rolling, but we'll cut out. 
All right. It's going to be entertaining. So when I do things like, well, let's talk about the connection between the alphabet and, or the invention of the alphabet, is that the... Oh, yeah, I know that, but I mean, I like just the opening, starting up the topic, because you're not hearing you asking me a question online. Like, how are you going to do this? Well, they're not going to hear me talk. It's just going to be me talking. It's going to be edited into... All right. An interesting story is the invention of the alphabet. Let me tell you this story. The Egyptians developed a hieroglyphic writing system. In other words, they would take a word and represent it by some kind of pictorial figure. And if you look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, you often see a bird, and you can identify different objects in the writing system. Now, when it came to representing foreign proper names, let us say somebody came to visit Egypt from outside of Egypt. How are they going to represent this person's name in their writing system? Well, they couldn't do it pictorially. So what they did was they invented 22 signs that represented basic phonemes. And they used those to represent foreign proper names. So let us say that uh, Sharon decided to visit Egypt. Well, Sharon is not a word in the Egyptian language, so they had to have something that represented the sound sh, a, r, o, and n. That was the beginning of an alphabet. But because they only used it for foreign proper names, it was not an alphabetic writing system. Now, down in the South Sinai, there were the coppersmiths. They're mentioned in the Bible. These are the people of Jethro, called the Kenites. Kenite is the Hebrew word for coppersmiths. These people mined copper. The very first alphabetic inscriptions were found in their mine shafts. How did they come to alphabetic writing? Well, they were trading with the Egyptians. And one day, I'm making up a story, this is a just so story. One day, one of these copper miners said, I'd like to write like you Egyptians do. And the Egyptians said to them, Oh, you'll never learn our hieroglyphic system. It's too complicated for you. You're just a copper miner. Why don't you use our are 22 unicontinental signs to represent basic sounds. And so, the very first alphabetic system took the 22 unicontinental signs from the Egyptian system and wrote everything with them. And it works on a rebus system. For instance, if I want to say bag, I would write, draw a picture of a bee, an apple, and a gun. And then I would go, ba a g bag. And that's how I would spell out the word bag, using the first letter of these three pictures. That's how the phonetic alphabet was invented. It was invented by the coppersmiths and was used in the South Sinai among the people in the Bible that were led by Jethro. Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses. And that's how the Hebrews picked up their alphabet, by their con contact with Jethro. Thought of as a Phoenician alphabet, even though we right. information saying that it came from the caves in the Sinai that you're referring to. Would the, the Phoenicians were the first to actually use it on a large scale level? No, they, it was, the reason we think of it as a Phoenician alphabet is because it was, came from the Greeks borrowed it from the Phoenicians with whom they traded. I'll talk, I'll talk about that right now. Well, I've just told the story of how the alphabet was invented in the South Sinai, transferred to the Hebrews who were uh, in contact with them through Moses. But the Semitic alphabet is often called the Phoenician alphabet. And the reason for that is that the Phoenicians also picked up this alphabet from the people in the South Sinai. Remember, all these people were speaking more or less the common language, the Semitic language. There were different dialects of it, but they understood each other. They traded with each other. And so the Phoenicians were using alphabetic writing as well. But the Phoenicians were famous for their uh, capacity for trading across the ocean. They were sometimes called the sea people. 
and they were trading with the Greeks. And in their trade with the Greeks, the Greeks said, hey, what are you guys writing? What are all those symbols meaning? And uh, the Phoenicians taught them their writing system. Now, in the Semitic alphabet, the first three letters are Aleph, Bet, Gimel. Aleph is a cow's head, Bet is a house, and Gimel is a camel. The Greeks picked up these names for the letters of the alphabet. They called them Alpha, Beta, Gamma. Alpha for Aleph, Beta for Bet, Gamma from Gimel. And so the Greeks called them the Phoenician alphabet. A European culture is based on Greek writing, Greek learning. And since they called that the Phoenician alphabet, we talk about the alpha, original alphabet as though it's Phoenician. But it actually belongs to the people of the South Sinai that were coppersmiths. People are going to be listening to the ideas. They won't notice the glare. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I hope it's because I'm... Right. One of the basic uh, things that comes across in your book is that this invention of the alphabet was so... Um, it happens at this intersection in history where um, monotheism and codified law and kind of a next step starts to happen in the organization, expansion, and uh, um, capabilities of civilization first in the Hebrews and then in the Greeks. Can you speak to that kind of exploding enablement? Well, one of the fascinating things about the alphabet effect is that it all took place in this tiny little geographic zone between the Tigris-Euphrates River and the Aegean Sea between 2000 and 500 BC. Why is that? Well, it happens to be the fact that ideas develop among people that are in contact with each other. Things don't happen in isolation. Ideas go back and forth. We know that, for example, people traveled from Mesopotamia, where they developed phonetic writing and codified law, that they traveled to Egypt. They traded with the Egyptians. In fact, it's thought that the Egyptians picked up their writing system not the actual form of the writing system, but the idea of writing from the Mesopotamians. We also know in the Bible there was a man named Abraham who lived in the city of Ur of the Chaldees. And he was unhappy with the conditions there. And he was some kind of religious fanatic who believed that there was only one God. So he took his people and he traveled from Ur, Mesopotamia, to Israel lived there for a while, then his people went down into Egypt, then out of Egypt, back to Israel. So there's all kinds of connections. Thales, the Greek um, philosopher, who was one of the first people to do geometry, he, it is known, traveled to Egypt and there learned about geometry, the measurement of land, because the Nile River overflowed every year and washed away all the boundaries between people's land. So what the Egyptians did was, they measured out how much land each person had. And after the flood waters receded, the person got back exactly the same amount of land he had before. So they became experts in measuring land. By the way, any extra land that was created by the flooding went to the pharaoh. Natural. Government always tries to grab whatever it can. One more. Yeah, back to um, the <laughs> alphabet itself and its a, and um, how it affected. Let, let's talk about um, civil organization. Um, what the alphabet as a tool, as an enabling tool, did for people that began. Well, we just talk about the invention of writing itself, which was non-alphabetic. Would you like to hear that story? Because sure. that gets into a book called The Sixth Language. All right, I'll do that.
My work with the alphabet uh, led me to try and understand the origins of writing itself, which is a very interesting story. Uh, writing began in Sumer, which is the same territory of present-day Iraq and was also the territory of Babylon and Mesopotamia. Now, the Sumerians were agriculturally oriented, that is, their economy was based on agriculture, but you know that this territory is very dry, it's a desert, but the soil is very rich. If water can be brought from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers to the farmer's fields, they can produce large, bountiful crops. And that's what happened. What happened was that the people in Sumer organized, starting around 8,000 BC, uh, irrigation systems. And in order to pay the people that built the ditches for irrigation, the priests would collect tributes from the farmers and redistribute the food to the irrigation workers so that the whole system would work. Of course, they took the best stuff for themselves and had a nice rich life, typical of bureaucrats today. Now, uh, in order to keep track of the tributes that were being paid by the farmers to the state, they would ha hand out little clay tokens as receipts. The Nishman Besserat analyzed these clay tokens that were found in grave sites between 8,000 BC and 3,000 BC and discovered that they were actually the origin of writing. Here's what happened. These clay tokens were pressed. Actually, no. These clay tokens were collected uh, in little baskets to represent the account of each individual farmer. At some point, the bureaucrats decided it would be useful to put all of the tokens of a particular farmer into a clay envelope. And they started that practice. But then they, and then they would roll on the outside surface of the envelope, a seal, which would represent the name of the farmer. After a while, they, about 50 years of this system, somebody said, you know, it's really annoying every time we have to find out what tokens are inside. We have to break the envelope. We have to make a new envelope. Why don't we press the tokens that are going into the sealed envelope on the outside surface, and then we don't have to break the envelope open? Great idea. Let's do it. They did it. It took another 50 years for someone to say, hey, if we press the tokens on the outside surface of these envelopes, we don't have to close the envelope and put the tokens inside. Fantastic. That was the first writing system. They were clay tablets that had pressed upon them these tokens that represented different agricultural commodities. Now, the system developed even further because as the population grew, the priests got into wholesale. That is, they had to deal with large quantities of agricultural commodities. So if a farmer brought in 43 sheep, he didn't want to press the little clay token for a sheep 43 times into the clay tablet. So someone came up with the following idea. They would use a bushel of wheat to represent 10, and a peck of wheat to represent one. So they would push the peck, the bushel, four times, the peck three times to represent 43, and then they would draw the picture of the sheep, not press the token in, because they had to distinguish between signs that represented numbers from signs that represented words. And voila, there you had both mathematical notation and written notation. And from there, the system grew into hieroglyphic style of writing. And that was the birth of writing. So you see, writing did not begin with poets or novelists. Writing began with bureaucrats, civil servants, that wanted to organize their society and keep track of accounts. So it was accountants and civil servants that brought us writing, not intellectuals. Although we must say that they were intellectuals too, because they came up with an information processing system.
They just were not artistic. <laughs> what are you going to do now? I'm going to your side. Oh, I love this. Thank you. How much material are you going to use of mine? Don't know yet. I think, uh, I mean, people do not, we talked about this briefly on the phone, people do not see the alphabet as this um, code. They don't understand its history. And you are, I think, the preeminent storyteller of how it comes into being, its effect on the world up through the Greeks and the Romans, anyway, and up, up, up into the printing press. The other piece that we bring in that interleaves with what you're doing is what in particular happened in England, in the English language, with the kind of breakdown of phonetic correspondence as the uh, oh, yeah. oral language and the Latin, Roman, and French use of the alphabet all kind of mishmash together. Uh, under King Henry V and his Chancery Scribes, you know, that story. Um, There's another story that maybe you want to tell, which is how the alphabet gave rise to the place number system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would love that. You do that one now? Okay. Are we, are we, we are rolling, right? Okay. Well, let me tell another interesting story. The connection between the alphabet and our place number system. We can represent any number with 10 symbols. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 0. How did that happen? Well, 0 was invented in India by Hindu mathematicians. You see, they had an alphabetic writing system that they borrowed from the Phoenicians. And so they could represent 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 with the letters of the alphabet, the first nine letters of the alphabet. The number 10 they represented with a tenth letter of the alphabet and the same with 11, 12, etc. Then they got into numbers like 20, 30, 40. Again, they were using alphabet. Now, some very clever guy came up with the idea of zero. And here's how it happened. They used an abacus to do their mathematical calculations. And if the abacus indicated that there were five hundredths, five beads in the hundred column, no beads in the ten column, and two beads in the one column, they wanted to write down that result. So they would write the symbol for five, they would write the symbol for 2, but there was a problem, because you could read that as 52, 502, 520, 52,000. There was an ambiguity. So some guy came up with a fantastic idea. He would write 5, then he would put a little circle to represent shunya, which in Sanskrit means leave a space, and then he would write 2. So you would read it as 5, leave a space, 2, which meant 5 hundredths, leave a space because there are no tens, and 2. And that's how 0 was invented. Now once you have 0, all of a sudden, mathematics goes crazy. Why? Because now you can talk about a negative number. Have you ever heard that it was so cold outside, it was 7 below 0? Well, that means minus 7, right? How did they write minus 7? They would write a little zero and below it a seven. So it's, it looked like seven below zero. That's how they represented minus seven. So with zero, you get negative numbers. Then they did it for algebra. 
Let's do a little algebra. Don't get nervous out there. We're going to do a simple little algebra. 5 times x equals 15. So you divide 15 by 5, x is equal to 3. How do they represent this in notation? They would write 5 shunya, or leave a space for the unknown, equals 15. And they were able to do algebra. By the way, let's talk about shunya, how you go from shunya to zero. The Hindus invented zero. They traded with the Arabs. The Arabs said, what a wonderful idea, we got to have our shunya. So they translated shunya, leave a space, into Arabic with the word sefer, which means leave a space. Then they started their number system, which we call Arabic numerals. Why do we call them Arabic numerals and not Hindu numerals? Because we in Europe borrowed them from the Arabs. This happened around the Renaissance time, when the Italian merchants in places like Venice, Genoa, Pisa, were trading with the Arabs. And they said, hey, what's this number system you're using? And they learned the number system. And they thought, this is fantastic. We have to use this number system too. So they took the word Cifer, and being Italian, they had to elaborate a little bit. They called it Zeferano. After they elaborated the name into Zeferano, then they had to come up with a short name for it, which they called Zero. And that's how we got the term Zero. But the word Cipher, or Cifer, as the Arabs pronounce it, crept into our language too. Cipher is a secret code. Why a secret code? Because the Pope at that time did not want his good little Italian Catholic boys using these Arabic numbers because he thought maybe they would convert to Islam or something. So they were forbidden from being used. But the Italian merchant said, okay, we go to church on Sunday. When we do business, we're going to use the Arabic numerals. And so they made use of zero. And they used it secretly, though. And that's why anything that's called a secret code is called a cipher to this day. <laughs> good story, huh? That's a good story. Um, so let's touch on... One of the things about what would be interesting is that the stories about the beginning uses of the alphabet in Greece, the empowerment. Like you said, there's 200 years between this, these two, this period in Greece when they get the alphabet and when science emerges. This, this transformation seems to happen coincident with them getting the alphabet. Another piece that I'm interested in, and speak to even the word, is the relationship between the alphabet and the printing press. Okay. Which is implicit in... Well, let's deal with the Greeks first. Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm fine. Um, we, deal, we dealt with the connection between the Greeks and science, didn't we? Mm -hmm. What more do you want? Um, well, we touched on that one, too. Let's, let's cycle that again. Their connection between the element, this elemental uh, components of the alphabet and atomistic thinking, right? The elemental... Uh, All right, let's talk about alphabet and atoms. Okay. Yeah. I got another interesting story for you. Alphabet and atoms. You know, the alphabet is the atoms of spoken language because we take spoken words, we break them down into their most basic units, phonemes, which are like the atoms of speech. Well, shortly after the Greeks were writing with an alphabet, they came up with the idea of the atom. They were speculating about what would happen if you divide something. Divide it once, divide it again, keep dividing. Eventually, you come down to something you cannot divide anymore. And you, when you can't divide something, it says they called it an atom, which means not splitting, not dividing. And so they thought that all, uh, all the materials of the world were made up of basic atoms, just like all words are made up of basic phonemes represented by the letters of the alphabet. Now, not all Greeks 
for, to the atomist point of view, there were other people that described things in terms of basic elements. For instance, Empedocles talked about four basic elements that made up nature. Air, fire, water, and earth. And he saw them as layers. At the very center was the earth, and that the next layer was the water, because you know the ocean sits on top of the land. And above the water is the atmosphere, which is air. And above the atmosphere is the sun, which is fire. And so that's how he divided the world into earth, water, air, and fire. Again, describing things in terms of basic elements. All right, printing press. The printing press was invented in China. And the way they would use the printing press was that they would take a wooden block and they would carve out in reverse what they wanted to print using their Chinese characters. And they would print the page, and after they printed so many copies of the page, they'd get another piece of wood and they would again carve the next page in reverse, and so on. This was a very tedious process, but that was Chinese printing. Many years later, the idea of printing came to Europe. And the first person to do printing was a fellow by the name of Jan Suns, a Dutchman, who copied the Chinese system of making a block out of wood, carving in reverse the page to be printed. But a very interesting invention was made by a fellow by the name of Gutenberg. Gutenberg came up with the idea of representing each letter of the alphabet with a single font. And what he would do was he would make 100 A's, 100 B's, 100 C's, 100 D's, and so on. He would then, and he made them out of lead, using molds. He would then assemble the page that needed to be printed by lining up all these little letter fonts along lines. He would print his page, print 100 or 200, whatever number of copies he wanted to make, and then he would disassemble the, the fonts and use them again to compose the next page. This was a much more efficient system. It was called movable type printing. And it's only possible if you have an alphabet. So the alphabet gave rise to the Gutenberg printing press, from which developed the Renaissance, the explosion of knowledge that took place shortly after the invention of the printing press. Do you have any...